Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another session of Facebook Live Chat with an Expert. We hold these sessions on um, alternate Tuesdays of every month during the fall um, to focus on questions that uh, on topics that have been requested by caregivers and that are relevant for caregivers. My name is Padma and I'm a learning specialist with the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Dr. Don Pearson, Clinical Associate Professor of Neurology. Uh, Dr. Pearson is very well known in the dementia field and is one of the top highly rated neurologists in Alberta. She's currently working with the Alberta uh, Neurologic Center. We are planning to spend about 20 to 30 minutes on the topic of the role of palliative care in dementia care. We invite you to ask questions for Dr. Pearson in the comment section of this video, and uh, Dr. Pearson will answer them as we get along. Considering the public nature of Facebook platform, we request you to avoid personal questions and to keep your questions general as general as possible. Okay, with that uh, uh, introduction, uh, I welcome Dr. Pearson to this chat. So welcome to the chat, Dr. Pearson. Thank you. Good to be here again. Great. Uh, so first of all, I'll begin with a very straightforward question of um, what is meant by palliative care and what is the goal? What are we trying to achieve through palliative care? Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a caveat this time um, because I am not trained as a, as a palliative care specialist, but uh, I certainly um, more and more we're discussing the role of this in dementia care mm -hmm. and uh, more and more I see situations where I would like to have that arranged where family could with the help of palliative care have their loved one at home mm -hmm. yeah. uh, um, and um, have all of the support that they need uh, mm -hmm. without having to go to a, a long-term care facility where Palliative care is not always built in to yes. that. So back to your question, I would welcome any comments from families or anyone who has had experience because I have had um, not that much success in finding or accessing it in Calgary. Okay. I'm, I'm not well informed about any coverage for that. And maybe Padma, you could address that as well. I don't know if it is... Oh, okay. That's a, that's a great question because uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, coverage too, but uh, we have had some of our, uh, you know, um, persons with dementia, the, the families that we are working with. We have heard from a couple, you know, who had the experience of using the palli palliative care services um, during the last few days of the person's life. And it made a huge difference to them, uh, the experience of the family. They had a much positive experience um, you know, in the, with, the, with the palliative care team. Uh, and they felt that that was the best thing that they, they have done. You know, of all the things they've done so far, that was the best, best of all things that they did. So um, I can do, do, I'm hearing some positive things as well. Uh, but um, I'm going back to the, to the question, which is what is yeah. palliative care? Um, so I, for a very long time, palliative care, I think, developed out of... Uh, the diagnosis of terminal cancers. Right. So yeah. that's very important for mm -hmm. uh, me, for example, to keep in mind because right. there are definite differences uh, between an end stage dementia patient and an yes. end stage cancer patient. Mm -hmm. there, there can be cognitive imp impairments, certainly with the right. patient, yeah. but it's not the norm. And therefore, it's not the norm for palliative. Um, nurses or doctors experience. So it's mm. a mismatch. But I believe the, the palliative care is meant to apply to the comfort level and mm -hmm. um, um, maximizing the most comfort uh, mm -hmm. and the best care for someone in their final stages uh, right. of life. And defining the final stages is um, maybe quite mm. predictable in many cancers. Right. Much less so in any type of dementias. And yes. especially if you think about a younger onset 
Mm -hmm. In their late 50s, they have frontotemporal dementia. They are quite cognitively impaired, where you would think that you could describe that as end stage. But systemically, or mm. all other medical systems, are working quite well and right. could go on for years. Yeah. And yeah. Palliat a palliative care role there, I don't, I don't know how to define that. I think mm. that that we have to sit with the palliative care people and probably work on some um, redefining of that. I yes. have no doubt there's a role for palliative, no right. doubt. And um, for many people with the most common dementia, which is Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. we have a pretty good handle on clinically what we can expect in right. Alzheimer's, in people with the old, elder onset, not the mm -hmm. young onset familial, but the older onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I think we can fairly well predict, and palliative could serve a great role, I think, um, in the last uh, right. several months, actually, uh, of their life. I would imagine some of the families you mentioned uh, may have wished they had palliative uh, help earlier. Earlier, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, it could be, you know, a little bit too late and too little. Uh, the, yes. That's a kind of, um, uh, ex that's an impression that we had. And um, just an offshoot from the first question. Um, I've heard that for terminal cancers, we have to, one of the conditions is the, the person, you know, the death of the person and impending death is a, an indication uh, for uh, palliative care is the same. Is it the same same criterion applied for dementia as well? So I, I it can't. I don't think it can be. Mm. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think uh, if if I were to make a referral asking for help from palliative care, right. um, I I would be most confident uh, in uh, an elder Alzheimer's patient, for example. Who, right. I have an idea of mm -hmm. where they've been, where right. they're going, and right. their risk of uh, pneumonias, urinary tract infections, is now quite high, um, right. with risk of um, uh, septicemia, for example, right. blood infection as a result, and often that's the final stages. Okay. Um, if I can see that, um, and palliative can be of service, that's where I would refer. Mm -hmm. If I am calling to refer my 59-year-old who is cognitively really uh, just yeah. behaviorally very impaired, mm. um, I would not, I would be, I don't think that would be accepted. That is true. Because that is true. I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. So I wonder if somewhere um, we can d develop something between home care Right. And palliative care for term, for terminal cancer, somewhere in between. In between. There's also the challenge, which you uh, brought up in a couple of the questions, and uh, in some of the literature, they bring up the challenge of yes. uh, palliative care staff, doctors and nurses, who are not used to working with cog with this degree of different cognitive impairments. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's a challenge. Yes. That's a challenge, and sometimes can make it more difficult family members mm -hmm. if the yes. palliative care person is not quite you know yeah. getting the the whole uh, picture or is uh, promoting uh, a pain medication for example a very large degree of palliative care is pain management mm -hmm. and that's, that's important in dementia also but yeah. I must say it's not something that I hear a lot from mm -hmm. patients that I, I can't get rid of this pain, this pain, this pain. Uh, I don't hear that. That's uh, true. We certainly can read their signals. If yeah, they're yeah, listening yeah. or whatever we want to treat, we definitely want to have pain management. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's the drive that exists in uh, in cancers where there are actual things. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think possibly it is the cognitive impairment that is um, taking away their ability to express their pain. So we That's have to look true. for some nonverbal signs of pain uh, to understand that could be the reason. Yeah, we'll talk about, I'll just come to the situation of um, persons living with dementia in a bit. But I just want to know, so from what, from what you chatted so long, Dr. Pearson, I understand that if you think about who is eligible to receive palliative care, 
it would be people who are in the terminal stages of a, an illness, an incurable illness, right? Yes. And yes, that is how it's defined. And that's always been the, the, the rub, if you will, in past, in, you know, 10 years ago when this started to be discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was, it's almost uh, similar to uh, medically assisted dying. Right. You have these kind of criteria which are being rethought Mm -hmm. in palliative care but yes it's terminal um, end right. stage yeah. uh, I would say that the perception of death is that it's imminent mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe days to weeks mm -hmm. uh, right. and, yeah. uh, and again I'm speaking as not a palliative care trained professional mm -hmm. but my this is my understanding from yeah. Yeah working with them with neurology patients. Right. So um, yeah, and then how do you define that? Yeah, in persons with dementia. Now that is always a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and I guess persons with dementia, living with dementia would benefit if a palliative care kind of approach was um, provided to them much earlier than you know confining it to the terminal stages because throughout the disease, there is role for that kind of a palliative approach, uh, improving their comfort levels, That's right. decreasing the distress that the person feels, and also the support for the family. Uh, I, yeah. yeah uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a specialty that I think melds quite well with dementia care. Right. I don't think that we should place the demand on long-term care staff Mm -hmm. also take responsibility for that. I don't think it can happen. So then the question comes, well, can that be arranged mm -hmm. while the person is in long-term care? Can yeah. the family work with somebody who comes in and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. goes? Yeah. Um, well, there are a lot, lot of things to be worked out. I think it's very doable, and I think there's a need. Um, right. I think there may require a little bit of specialized training. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, when we think about the dementia context, it would be the um, end stage of uh, dementia where palliative care is at this point of time prescribed. Is, is it right in saying that? Am I right if I say that? Uh, it, yes, I would say um, that, uh, that in, at the, in this time, mm -hmm. You are making any kind of referral it would have to be something like end stage end stage okay um so um again um, you know based on our discussion we both agree that um it is actually indicated earlier right it is there's there is a valid justification for uh, prescribing or advising palliative approach earlier but that is the situation right now okay that makes sense um and uh, this, you know, it, it can be, I've read in some literature that palliative approach for persons with dementia can be even um, provided along with standard treatment. Well, what would you say to that? Um, so <clears throat> I did, I have, uh, it, I, I'm not sure what is meant by standard treatment, but mm -hmm. that is, you know, a person is on a, um, uh, Colonistries, yes, or yeah. something yeah. like that. Yes, there would yeah. be no reason that that couldn't continue. Of okay. course, the, on the flip side of that, sometimes we believe those medications are much less effective in later stages. That is true. So if a person is not swallowing well, for example, I, mm -hmm. I push the the uh, pill form. Right, um, right, right. Um, but anything and everything for uh, comfort, comfort, and also. As, as palliative uh, specialists, I think, do remarkably well. Mm -hmm. They try to help comfort without, uh, with, but, but still allowing the person to have enough awareness to interact with family. Right. And, and I would like, you know, that would, that's a very, very nice approach for a dementia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially, yeah. No family would want to see their person with dementia suffer that pain or you know, being in distress, they would rather prefer seeing the person uh, comfortable 
so that you know they still can have some quality uh, of time you know of life at that time um, what are some of the um, okay one more, one more question i want to ask so if first right now as um, you know in the current circumstances is a per, if a person with dementia is on some um, standard um, medications like the um, as the cholinesterase inhibitors uh, for alzheimer's disease uh, for instance uh, is a person expected to stop it stop all medications um, at that stage when they are going to palliative care I don't. So the medications that we consider standard treatment, they're mm -hmm. not, they do not, they do not cross into that domain of life sustaining, right? Uh, yeah. Like an antibiotic right. or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think there would be any requirement to eliminate those medications like I don't know, thyroid medication, for example. Okay. Um, that, that's not a requirement unless there is an intervention that will help comfort and it somehow interacts negatively with something else. Then there would be a discussion. Uh, okay. And everyone, I think, would, would decide on what is in the patient's best interest. Okay. Yeah, the reason why I asked was that uh, for uh, especially for some distress that happens, um, uh, you know, that uh, persons with uh, living with dementia can experience. Now, I have heard some neurologists say that um, these, um, you know, the, these medications, the cholinesterase inhibitors medications can help even, even if it's not improving cognition, they can still help um, and manage that uh, distress and, uh, you know, that uh, those kind of behavioral symptoms that happen. So that is why I asked whether the person is required to uh, stop all medications before they go into palliative care. And uh, I, that's, that is uh, very true. And my only experience with that is um, with families that have, hmm. in, in later stages, they have said, well, let's try going off it. It's just another pill. And they right. notice a, a negative change. And so we go back. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that clarity. All right. It is modifying a brain chemical that can affect um, mm -hmm. temper anxiety, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, absolutely. I don't think there's any uh, requirement to get rid of that. Okay. Okay. Especially That's wonderful. It would then uh, cause an increase in agitation, which mm -hmm. then there's a whole other discussion that has to take place about right. agitation. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us some, some of the common symptoms that occur in the end stage, final stage of dementia? And uh, I also say, uh, if you can tell us how palliative care will fit in to make the person more comfortable. Right. So there, as I'm sure you well know, and many people in, in the audience know this, um, depending on what where what website or what piece of literature you look at, the stages of dementia can be anywhere from you know three to seven. I tend to be a three stage person, mm -hmm. uh, which is earlier, right. moderate, severe. But there are uh, quite a few pieces that describe the seven stages, mm -hmm. and and I can point out based on the seven stages, starting with appears normal and it can cover up lapses in memory. That's number one, that's for like an Alzheimer's patient. Mm -hmm. um, in the seventh, the last stage, um, which would be considered end stage, mm -hmm. um, there is loss of speech. Right. Um, the person may not fully realize um, who he is or who is in the room with him or her. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes definite incontinence of bowel and bladder, right. uh, unable to feed self, um, mm -hmm. uh, not oriented. That's a that's a given. And sometimes uh, the limbs are are either stiff or um, uh, they're they're not able to organize walking and motor. Right. They yeah. are mostly bed to chair. In bed. Yeah. That would be approaching or that would be considered um, end stage right right 
um, how about if the person stops uh, feeding themselves, you know, stops eating, refuses food and water? Would that be considered as uh, the towards progressing as an indication that the person is moving towards the end stage? Yes, I suppose. That's, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, yeah, my father-in-law had that symptom. You know, he had Parkinson's disease, dementia. And uh, towards the end, he refused. He refused all food and drinks. And, uh, you know, the, the doctor, the, the, the attending physician suggested putting in a tube. And he did not want that. We knew, we knew that. Even though we did not have the papers in order. I'm talking about 2000, the year 2000, you know, years, 20 years ago. But still, his wishes were very clearly known to the family. So they decided, okay, we will not go with that. Yes. Yeah. So for us, it was an indication that he's, go, you know, nearing that final stage. It's, it's interesting in that case, for example, the cognitive uh, ability mm. there to make the decision. So often in a, in a, in a regular Alzheimer's patient, uh, later stage, I wouldn't even um, yeah. sure yeah that yeah. you could cognitively make that decision yeah, yeah. at that point. Yeah. I, but, but it could be considered end stage and they may, um, at some level, they know that they're not happy with this existence and they're not eating or drinking. One thing that uh, I consider, and I imagine I would discuss it with a palliative care team, would be whether um, uh, just not not sustaining or doing anything against the patient's wishes, but, mm -hmm. uh, but to uh, put a little bit of IV fluid on board just to help yeah. comfort yeah. level. Yeah. 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 I, I, don't, I don't know uh, the ins and outs of, of that, but I, I do think that sometimes having some little bit of hydration just helps keep it. That's true. Yeah, yeah. The general way. appearance too, right? So uh, that's that the family is able to see the person. Otherwise, it, uh, you know, dehydration can be with the face and mouth all dry. It can be yes. very hard. Yeah. I just think it's uh, with, and that doesn't go against the patient's wishes, but right. yeah. uh, it still addresses comfort level, mm -hmm. at, you know, at the exit or at the end stage. Okay. So how can a family who is, you know, uh, you know, at the end, you know, they have their person with dementia at the end stage, final stage, how can they decide what is the best uh, treatment option uh, that should be made available to their person? Um, right. So uh, is, so if the person is in long-term care, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, so the important, the answer, the quick answer is discussion. If yes. you're with the person at home, discuss with the family doctor. Yes. Because I don't want to um, to have the people be frustrated and not know where to go. I mean, I literally go to a palliative care website in mm -hmm. Calgary to find even someone to speak to about the possibilities. Right. So I would say if your loved one is at home and you, you'd like to do that mm -hmm. there, palliative care is help. Talk mm -hmm. with the family doctor who right. will make the referral. Okay. If in long-term care, uh, again, I don't, you cannot, I think, uh, especially with COVID and, and the kind mm -hmm. of strain on the long-term care system, you cannot place it on them to also be able to uh, yeah. train. Yeah. So uh, somewhere there needs to be a discussion, family and the manager staff at mm -hmm. the facility can right. some come in and support us from palliative either MD or nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, not sure that these things exist, but it's worth the discussion. Okay, okay, great. Uh, and uh, is it possible, do, do, will the person have to go to the hospital to get, and be admitted in the hospital to get palliative care, or can it be made available at home, uh, if the person lives in right. home or in a care facility? You're right, that's a, that's a good question because the reality um, in, uh, Alberta, maybe elsewhere, but the reality is uh, sometimes there are crises at home and the patient with dementia is admitted to hospital and that's where they wait for. Oh, okay. So I, we, I understand that reality. 
And in fact, there are times where a person with late, later stage dementia is in hospital and I, we have consulted palliative care team. Okay. Yeah. I, what I would be, of course, everyone would be hesitant to come anywhere near the hospital right now. And I would support that. Um, right. I, don't, I don't want to say that you should come to hospital in order to get that consult. Mm -hmm. I think that the price, uh, the emotional and the physical price that the patient yeah. may pay is too high um, yes. for that. But you, there are palliative care teams who are available for consultation in hospital. So if your loved one is in hospital for another reason and you'd yeah. like to pursue this, that mm -hmm. would be a good time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rather than, uh, you know, think about it in the, during the f final stages, maybe ha have maybe, those maybe discussions early. Be, first of all, they, re they make recommendations to the um, care team in mm -hmm. hospital, so to the internal medicine or the neurology team. Yeah. They make res uh, recommendations for better pain control or, or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then, secondly, they will help. Um, right. Something can be set up for when their discharge home. Okay, great, great. Um, and who provides palliative care? Which team? It's a team, a nurses? It's or a team. Um, it is, in it, uh, my experience with the palliative care team is there are definite MDs who are palliative physicians. Mm -hmm. They often do also pain management and right. palliative care. Yeah. They're very deeply uh, embedded. Right. Uh, there will be nurse practitioners and nursing teams. I, I am not aware of, of, of a lot of nursing aides, for example, because oftentimes you are dealing with, if you're dealing with pain management, you're dealing with morphine and narcotics, and you need yeah. to have the availability mm -hmm. of someone mm -hmm. who can make a decision there instead of waiting for calling the doctor yeah. who yeah. you talk to yeah. in three days and yeah. yeah, that's to me the beauty of palliative care is having uh, someone very, very nearby mm -hmm. can help with decisions like that. Okay. Um, how can uh, palliative care be supportive for the family as well? How can they support the family? So, I, I well, in numerous ways, and this, this is something that uh, anyone out there who has experienced palliative care teams in hospice mm -hmm. or in uh, with a cancer with a relative with cancer will know that they are available for uh, almost any kind of support mm -hmm. um, whether it's spiritual um, right or it's referring for counseling they are there to uh, provide you know all of that for for the family mm -hmm. and they will also uh, help not mediate, but they will, they will help, I think, in those situations that we are almost never prepared for, where, for example, there may be too many family members in the, in the room, right? That's true. That's true. So you can just highlight things uh, like, okay, it would probably be better one at a time. I can mm -hmm. see that it's becoming overwhelming. You right. know, yeah, yeah. So they're very good, I think, at modifying how the family and patient can be together mm -hmm. and in the best way for everyone. Yes, yeah. Uh, and also I think, um, uh, I believe, you know, from what our client said, um, they, they had the opportunity for the entire family to be in a side room and they had meals together, all that was allowed. And um, the support, you know, if the person, when the person wanted to, no, the person's belief was that they should be reading the Bible. Someone should read the Bible out to them. And that was also read out to the person at that time. So family found that all very supportive. Uh, and another question I want to ask is, is grief management also a part of palliative uh, care, care approach? Uh, I, uh, so while they are present, for sure, in the care of the patient, um, mm -hmm. that happens almost automatically with every interaction I right. find with people that are trained in palliative. Um, after, so if the person passes, they will try to make
make sure you're linked up mm -hmm. with uh, whatever type of group you're comfortable with, either counsel, grief counseling group, or um, they will make recommendations or referrals, or they will communicate with the doctor on the team right. to make that referral. Okay. Um, so uh, palliative care not only improves the quality of life of the person with dementia in the end stage, but also supports the family, right? So it works uh, like both ways. It can improve the quality of life of both uh, parties, right? Um, There's something quite unique about, for the family uh, hmm. of having someone who is close to the situation, understands the situation, and they can speak to that person fairly frequently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a daily visit. It may be brief. Yeah. It may not be every day. Mm -hmm. um, it may start out once a week and then become every day. Um, yeah. That is an amazing um, support. support for family just to have a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, That's good. the reason I'm discovering that is because with COVID um, mm -hmm. and the difficulties for some of my patients getting out. I have now a handful of people where I do either virtual or phone appointments mm. right. every three to four weeks. Yeah. And they, they, with, often with the family member. Right. right. The, yeah. the patient may not be that verbal, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm finding that they are, they're, they're just benefiting from that so much yeah. more than yeah. even a, you know, every three month visit. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, with or without the patient, it's been a, an eye opener for me. Mm, um, yeah, especially the when we do it virtually, and I yes. actually see the patient. Yes, uh, but yeah. also with all the family, and there's a mm. conversation. Yeah, it must be very reassuring for them. I just you know to be able to <laughs> chat with you and see you and get that you know know that what's going on, and yeah, I can I can imagine that. Uh, now, actually, you know, if you talk about, uh, we said how much palliative care can improve the quality of life of both the person as well as the family. But in reality, uh, how many persons living with dementia actually receive palliative care? Uh, according to the Canada research, uh, there are uh, at least, um, if, if we're looking at seniors with dementia, Mm -hmm. At least uh, two thirds of those eligible yes. never received the consult, or mm -hmm. the consult is never made. Right, and that includes um, uh, hospital mm -hmm. patient um, yeah, right. as well as outpatient. So it's now that's Canada wide. I don't believe that's that's not an Alberta statistic. Mm -hmm. um, I I think that there are definite uh, gaps in. Right. Um, how to access. Right. So what could be some of the reasons for that gap, Dr. Pearson? Yes. Um, one is, is the dementia itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do believe that patients will always have a bit of a different flavor from someone with terminal cancer who may right. or may not have cognitive yeah. uh, issues mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any type, right? Yeah, uh, many, many, many will have delirium and can have changes. It's not that palliative care never sees altered cognition, mm -hmm. but a dementia patient that has uh, been through, uh, you know, years of change and mm -hmm. memory loss and uh, right. who knows what dynamics with the family during yeah, that yeah, time, yeah. which is mm -hmm. reasonably challenging. That's a lot for a palliative care team member to walk into. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of it, I think, is understanding uh, dementia. The fact yeah. that this has not been a diagnosis made in the last year or two, it's probably a diagnosis that could have been made 10 years ago. You're right. Yeah. So many people have been through quite a lot in those mm -hmm. years. Yes. Yeah. That's one thing. Um, we already touched on uh, predicting time of death. That That's true. That has been something very... Yeah. Definitive in, in, in palliative care, we, we mm. can't uh, always provide that, so it needs right. to be uh, defined. The criteria need to be mm. really defined. Mm. Yeah. Uh, limited access, so um, especially no access really mm. rurally across Canada, rural or 
remote and even uh, limited in cities. Right. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so I came across a report. Uh, it's a CH, uh, CIHR report in 2015. And it said that uh, only one in 20, that's 5% of older persons with or without dementia received palliative care in 2015. Even though it was estimated that 67% who died in hospitals deserved palliative care. You know? So that's the reality that I, that's the stats I found. Uh, do you expect that palliative care would be made more easily available to persons with dementia in the future? Is anyone advocating for that? Yes, I think, I think there are even many people within palliative care who are actively uh, promoting that kind of thing, but they also see the need to uh, uh, redefine it. Yes, slightly. yeah. Um, there are many, many things that are similar. Comfort is uh, key. Um, mm -hmm. Not hospitalizing is That's another. right, that's right. And it can actually um, you know, amount to uh, cutting back the cost as well, right? I because the care. end of life care in a hospital can be really expensive. Absolutely. Yeah, cost. And the, this way that you can cut back on the cost at the same time, you can improve the quality of care and improve the quality of life of the person with dementia as well as their family. And ideally, I would hope, I think with this, the option being in the home with family is also uh, more possible. Um, and that's, that would be just you know, very helpful because I think long-term care facilities across the country are, are really stretched to the- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. many people would very much like to have their, their loved one at home, but they, they're not- That's true, yeah. I not, think many older persons also may, not, may want to, you know, um, die at home rather than right. in a hospital ICU. That's right. That's yeah, that right. is so scary. Even even to watch it, you know. Yeah, it's not a pleasant experience for anyone. Yeah, um, it's okay for family members to uh, to to um, uh, to understand that it's normal to have pro have problems dealing with incontinence. Right. your loved one and all that. I, I don't think people, often my, my patient families feel guilty because they have trouble doing that or it's, I, I don't think there's any uh, guilt there. And it's true. Uh, but I think it's very difficult. It's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Invasive, it just is not comfortable. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, palliative care coming in to support those features can allow you to breathe freely and be with the person um, absolutely as yeah. we are without the need. Yeah, one, one final question before we buy, you know, close for the day. Um, can families uh, request for palliative care if that's not been uh, provided to them or that's not been suggested, can they actually request? Uh, in, uh, in the hospital, they yes. definitely- Yeah, yeah in, the, in the final stages, if they know that it's an end stage, can they request? Absolutely. I think if, you know, it's an early diagnosis and the person is very likely going to be here for 10 years, I don't think palliative care is just right going to be accessible at this time. That's true, that's true. Yeah, but it's only, it'll be towards the end, right? In uh, advanced dementia, that is when, okay. Yeah, and, um, and would the family need to make those conversations early or can they, uh, uh, is it possible for them to request even during that final uh, end stage? Uh, sorry, say again. Uh, well, they, does the family have to make plans for, you know, arranging that palliative care early on? Or uh, is it still possible for the family to, you know, when they're de actually dealing with that, going through that end stage disease, can they request? Right. I think it's difficult to, uh, to uh, have anything in place early on. Okay. I, I, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So th thank you very much. This has been such an interesting conversation and uh, thank you for joining us today. And a special thank you to uh, Dr. Pearson 
for I think this is the fourth or fifth time you have been such a great sport. You have been such a wonderful resource for our caregivers during this pandemic. So here's a big thank you from all of us from the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. Uh, and we, and it's been such a pleasure as always. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you today. Uh, and thank you to all of you uh, who joined us. Um, and uh, in two weeks time, uh, in two weeks time, we'll have another chat. So please do um, join us for that chat. It is uh, on the topic of uh, uh, sleep disorders in dementia. And the chat will be with Dr. Alicia Cislak. Um, and it will be in the morning around the same time, two weeks from now. And if you really enjoyed this presentation, if you learned, benefited from this uh, chat, please uh, do like and share the video with your, with your uh, contacts. And please follow the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary Facebook page for more videos in the future. So that's all from us uh, today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Padma. Thank you. It's been great to have you. So thank you. See, talk to you later.